Welcome back to Exploratory Data Analysis. What we're going to do now is try to understand how do we make sense out of the workplace. The first step is taking a look at the observations we have about the work and trying to say, what is the way things are actually happening? Now, there are three methods that we can use for doing this. The first is called the spaghetti diagram. What we're going to do is we're going to use a spaghetti diagram to start at the source of the problem or where we see the output of the process happening and trace the process flow backwards. Now, we'll talk about the spaghetti diagram in just a little bit, but as we trace it back, we're going to be asking ourselves the five why questions. And so asking why five times will allow us to have a rational means to trace the flows back to the source of the problem. Once we get to the source of the problem, we're going to use the 5W1H methodology to identify it and define the problem. So let's see how this actually works. In Japan, they talk about flows in an organization. They've identified seven different types of flows. So a physical flow is how material parts or subassemblies are actually moving in a process. So typically we see parts going into subassemblies, subassemblies going into larger assemblies, and then formulating that into a product which is packaged and shipped. And that's a physical flow of work. Sometimes we can also see asset flows. So an asset flow is when we start seeing vehicles moving things, and we start seeing the, the flow of what we've invested in the company actually making a difference. A logical flow is when we see data or information flowing, as in an information technology system. Human flows, we can say people walking or moving from one step to another, or developing themselves in terms of their level of competence. A financial flow is where we see money moving. We see money coming from uh, investors and going into equipment. We see money coming from buyers going into processes, being used in certain ways to you know, pay suppliers or to pay salaries, and then profit and shareholders. And we can see cash flow about investments. We can also see conceptual flows where an idea develops, like in design, where a conceptual idea becomes more and more firm and finally it becomes the product or service of the organization. We can also see authoritative flows, where we see decision-making processes in terms of who gets to have the right to make a decision and who's held accountable for the quality of that decision. So all of these are different types of flows that could be traced. When we use a spaghetti diagram, what we're doing is we're trying to identify where is the waste in the process. The idea in a spaghetti diagram is we'll map out perhaps the physical flow like we'll have the whole uh, factory shop floor. And we'll see, here's production equipment, uh, here's a conveyor belt, and, and here's incoming uh, received goods, and here's where we have a packaging station and so forth. And what we'll do is we'll start saying, if I take a look and I start at one point, I say, the, the, the flow is like this, and we have this sort of, sort of flow, and we start seeing then repeating patterns. And over the period of some time, as we start adding up these one-piece flows, from beginning to end, we start seeing what looks like a spaghetti bowl, okay? And that's what we call it. So we'll see workflows connecting workstations. And as we're, we're trying to understand what happens, we can go back and travel that distance and say, okay, we had this distance traveled. Uh, there was a lot of waiting time in the process. We saw workstations, nothing was happening here, no value add, and we can start understanding the components of that process work, how it's adding value or losing value. And as we go back from one station to the other, starting perhaps at the end, and it's easiest to trace it, and we can then say, let's use the five whys. Why was this happening? And what was the basis for this particular thing? And we're actually then unfolding one layer at a time, sort of the onion, if you will. We're peeling the, the layers back on an onion and trying to identify what was actually at the core? What was the real reason why all of this happened in the beginning? And so as we get to that final reason and we start seeing what it is, we can then use the 5W1H method. The 5W1H method was actually defined uh, for reporters or investigative reporters to describe a story. So they're gonna ask five questions. So what happened? What was the object? Who did it? That was the subject. When did it happen? The timing. Where did it happen? The location. And why did it happen? What was the purpose? And finally, we asked the question, how did it happen? What was the method by which we got this observation? 
So as we've answered all of those things, we've actually begun to describe the problem. But this is now a problem narrative. It's a way to conceptually identify the problem, but we have not yet operationally defined it as a problem statement. So we haven't worried about the key measurable characteristics that are able to unambiguously describe what is the situation. And so we need to understand the physical measurements, the boundary of the problem, the different rational subgroups involved that can be analyzed that contribute to the overall performance. And at that point in time, we can have the problem statement, which we talked about earlier in terms of the uh, project charter. So what's the quantitative measure that's agreed by management? What's the performance trend we want to have? Do we want to increase it, reduce it, or control it? What's the desired state we'd like to have of this process? What's the time limit over which we want to, to achieve that? And so what's critical for us is to understand that in this process, some rational subgroup, some part of that process may be destroying our capability to live, deliver that type of goal. So how can we identify where we see those process steps that are degrading the ideal performance of the process? This is what we are gonna use the rational subgroups for. For instance, if we have three or four pieces of equipment that are all the same, or several different people doing the same job, what's the difference in terms of the performance? Is all the equipment equal? Are all of the people equal? And what we see is there's natural variation happening in every process. So some are better and some are worse. And the reason some may be better or worse is because they're following a different procedure. So what we would like to have is identify the best of the best. Which process steps are happening the best? And can we repeatedly make that happen within all the instances of that rational subgroup? So if we're talking about people, can we standardize the way people work? We try to do that with work instructions. Can we standardize the way we have equipment dealing with? Well, we try to standardize that with the setups of the equipment and how we actually run it over time. And then we're gonna stratify these rational subgroups according to the process step. And what we'll see next in our next video is how do we actually analyze that work in those process, those rational subgroups to figure out where we can make improvements happen in this process and help it move closer towards its ideal level of performance.